Have you ever wondered if beets will help your erections? I'm Dr. Rena Malik, urologist and pelvic surgeon. Welcome back to the Rena Malik MD podcast, your source for evidence-based information about your sexual health and more. This month is our special monthly episode of Ask Me Anything. We gather questions from social media, from our email newsletter subscribers, from our premium member subscribers, and we answer them every month. If you're interested in joining our premium membership, each and every month, you'll get early access to our podcast episodes, as well as transcripts from each episode and a special section where you can specifically put your Ask Me Anything questions. All right, let's get to it. My coworker eats a can of beets every day. At first, I thought he was just a health nut, but he says he does it because it makes nitrous oxide, which is good for blood flow. Is that true? Would it help with erections? Yeah, so this is a good question. So nitric oxide is the ignition for erections. It's a chemical molecule that's made by our blood vessels and our nerves. And so in order to have enough nitric oxide around, you need to have good, healthy blood vessels that produce that nitric oxide. Once you have nitric oxide, this is the signal or the ignition for the erection. So what happens is nitric oxide diffuses into the cells. It goes through a chemical pathway that then allows the muscles in the penis to relax and the blood vessels to dilate, allowing blood to flow into the penis and stay there. Then as the chemicals break down, the blood flows back into the body and the erection goes away. If you have more nitric oxide, that essentially means you have more ignition for erections. Now, do beets actually help with that? I made an entire video on my YouTube channel about nitric oxide boosters because they're a big category where people talk about things that can boost nitric oxide. Specifically, when you talk about foods, there are certain studies that have looked at different types of foods that that can increase the amount of nitric oxide in your body. They haven't actually looked at foods specifically with erections. Nitrate-rich foods, which are specifically like whole foods, we're not talking about nitrates that you get from smoked meats or things like that. Specifically whole foods, things like arugula, leafy greens, beets, those things are high in nitrates. When you want to actually see a difference in the amount of nitric oxide in your blood, the studies have shown that it's somewhere between 450 and 550 milligrams of nitrates is what's required to see that benefit. Now, again, I don't know if that will actually translate to better erections. Now, if these foods can be incorporated into your diet, you enjoy eating them, and you are not overdoing on calories because beets can be a little sweet and sugary, then it's very reasonable to incorporate them in your diet. They certainly can help, and there's certainly no downside. Now, in terms of other things that may help, nitric oxide boosters, a lot of them don't have active ingredients that actually work. The things that do work are things like L-citrulline and L-arginine that have been shown in small studies to improve blood flow and potentially erectile function. Okay, next question from Donald. Is vaginal estrogen safe? We always get the worries about estrogen and cancers and things like that, but is vaginal estrogen safe? Yeah, well, let's talk about why you would need vaginal estrogen. So vaginal estrogen is used for primarily when you have low estrogen states. Now, the most commonly known low estrogen state is when you have menopause, right? And after women go through menopause and during perimenopause, their estrogen drops very, very low. Now, this actually very much affects the tissues of the vagina and the vulva. This is because they have very many estrogen receptors in the vagina. And the issue with this is it's not like hot flashes, which occur for a short period of time and then go away, once you have low estrogen, those tissues start seeing those changes and it progressively gets worse over time. And so people can develop dryness, discomfort, they can have pain with sex, and they can get recurrent urinary tract infections. And so the reason to take vaginal estrogen is to prevent all of those things. Now, other low estrogen states could be someone who is lactating, who just had a baby and who might be breastfeeding their child. They also lose estrogen during that time. And so they can also find discomfort during sex or dryness, and they can also benefit from vaginal estrogen. Now, is it safe? So when you think about estrogen, right, the concern with estrogen is that it might cause, uh, there's all these talks about causing heart attacks or strokes or blood clots, but that is only in very specific scenarios and not completely understood. Vaginal estrogen, however, is very localized to the tissues. Only a small amount gets absorbed systemically, meaning that when you you use vaginal estrogen and most of it just stays in the tissues and you don't get anywhere near a premenopausal or normal amount of estrogen in your body. Now, some people will get some breast tenderness very early on when they start using it because they go from having 
no estrogen to just a little bit, and that's enough for their body to respond. But usually they get used to it over time and it's very, very safe. There has never been a reported blood clot, cancer, heart attack, or anything related to vaginal estrogen. In fact, a lot of experts are trying to lobby with the FDA to remove the black box warning on vaginal estrogen because it actually has a very different risk profile than, let's say, oral estrogen, for example. All right, it's good to know. So one is more systemic, one's more local. Next question, what can I do to fix delayed ejaculation, which many times can take over two hours, if ever? Is there another another medication or treatment? This is another one from one of our subscribers. Great question. So delayed ejaculation is essentially taking a prolonged period of time or being unable to ejaculate or orgasm. And this is actually a real problem. It's not talked about quite as often as premature ejaculation, but estimates say about 9% of people suffer from delayed ejaculation. And this can be something that's lifelong. So you've always taken longer than usual to ejaculate. And usually we say at least 30 minutes or longer would be sort of considered delayed. And some people develop it over time. Now, some people who develop it over time, it can be due to age because the nerve receptors and the sensors in the penis are less receptive and so they don't feel as much pressure or sensation as they used to. Or it can be because they've sort of developed some idiosyncratic masturbation habits, meaning they've gotten really accustomed to masturbating a certain type of way or having a certain type of stimulation that allows them to climax an orgasm and they cannot achieve that with a partner. So that may be someone who's just noticing that that they have no problems at all when they masturbate, but when they try to engage with a partner, it takes forever. And so in those cases, we need to work on sort of figuring out what's going on during masturbation or what cues you're using to get aroused and how can we sort of modify them, keep them varied, maybe take a break from them for some period of time and incorporate some diversity or do those things with your partner if you're happy with that and sort of figure out how you can achieve climax. If these things are not working or this is not the issue, we do have some off label medications for delayed ejaculation. Now, delayed ejaculation doesn't have any on-label medications, meaning there's no, while there's been studies for this and there has been some evidence for medications that work, there's none that have met the criteria to be on-label. And so these are basically medications that have been prescribed for some other purpose that we found that help people with delayed ejaculation. Now, some of the ones that I tend to use are things like bremelanotide, which I've talked about on my YouTube channel before, so I'll link that in the show notes. Bremelanotide essentially works on the brain and the melanocortin receptors, and it increases the pro-desire hormones. And so it's actually on label for low sexual desire or hypoactive sexual desire disorder for premenopausal women. But it also increases desire in men and in some cases can help men reach ejaculation or orgasm sooner. Sometimes I'll also add oxytocin, which is another hormone that works in the brain to help sort of improve time to ejaculate. Another off-level medication that can be used is cabergolin, which works to essentially decrease prolactin, which will hopefully offset. Prolactin is the hormone that's released after ejaculation. So, so hopefully that will offset some of that and allow you to reach ejaculation sooner. Again, these are not, we don't have great studies on them. Success rates are usually around 60% or lower because we just don't have great evidence yet or great things that can help. You can also use use different types of devices to help you get stimulated differently. So there are some devices, but they haven't been studied really rigorously to see if they will help. But ultimately, it takes experimentation, working with a doctor, like someone who's an expert in sexual medicine, to help you sort of try these different things and find what works for you. Thank you guys so much for joining us. If you want to hear the rest of this AMA, make sure to join the premium membership. That's the only place we post the entire full-length AMA. And as always, we're going to take care of yourself because you're worth it.